Hello and welcome to the Gallant View podcast for our Premier League show. My name is Mason Stewart and I'll be your host. As always, please like and subscribe and get any comments in for us um, next week. Uh, with me tonight, we're starting with Jamie. How are you, Jamie? Um, I've definitely had better days when it comes to football results, but I would get absolutely assaulted if I didn't show my face this evening after what has been an absolute shit week. And I'm including the Europa League in that of uh, football. So here I am, uh, tail between my legs, ready to take a lick in because I know Johnny's coming for me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, do you know what? Sometimes talking about it helps. It helps, doesn't it, Johnny? <laughs> the the <laughs> missus said that. I, can't, I made a sleep in the living room. <laughs> Good to have you on, mate. And Johnny, how are you? I am great, mate. Great, mate. Not a bad weekend. Some football could have been better, but from a Premier League point of view, I'd say it was fantastic. Uh, so it's good to be back on. Yeah, from a Premier League point of view, it was it was good um, as a, as a neutral. Um, Jamie, I'm oh, sorry. Let's let's get it out early, eh? Um, let's get it over and done with it. Let's get it over and done with uh, Liverpool. Man United, Bournemouth, go. <laughs> 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 let's let's start with a game at Anfield. Um, it, it, as you said, it, it went from bad to worse with the defeat yeah. to Atlanta uh, on Thursday night, and, and I think Sunday. I actually didn't realise this till today. It was the first defeat in twenty eight games um, at Anfield in the Premier League, yeah. and it was Palace's first win in the Premier League in thirteen. So there was, you know, to, to put onto that, that, obviously the result meaning. Coming off the top, and Man City, you know, starting to pull away. Um, from a Liverpool point of view, what, what did you make of it? <clears throat> bit, a bit of sweet, if I'm honest. Um, as I said, the, the, the Europa League was a bit of a humbling. Um, you know, anybody looking at that result would think that that was probably the away leg, when actually it was a home leg. It's not very often we get a spanking on our own doorstep. Um, and I, I fully went into that game against Palace, thinking. When was the last time Liverpool lost two games in a row at Anfield? Like, this is unheard of territory on the clock. This this is going to be, we're going to correct it today. And it totally didn't happen. Um, Palace did an absolute number on us. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a hard one because, you know, on paper, it looks like an absolute disaster. And it is an absolute disaster when you look at the standards Liverpool set. I would say I would be more concerned if we were sitting there talking about we weren't creating. You know, we had no shots on goal. and But truth be told, we still created. We had, there was last ditch tackles. There was uh, point blank saves by the goalkeeper. You can put that down to poor finishing, but we were still making chances. But for whatever reason, we've just turned shot shy. Um, whether it's Darwin's... Um, runs have become very predictable. Salah's passing have become very predictable. All of a sudden, you're looking for sparks all over the park. And Alexis McAllister has been brilliant over the last three months. And all of a sudden, he's just turned average for the last two weeks. You, you can tell that the fatigue's catching up with them. You know, I wouldn't say they're running out of ideas. They just they don't have a plan B, should I say. And the plan B right now is bringing Jota and Gakpo into the field and try and see if they can get lucky. And yeah, um, Hats off to Palace. They, you know, they, they 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 knew that Liverpool had been really, really poor from the starting games, um, and and that's exactly what they did. Um, there was a, a killer had to make a save like a minute before the actual goal went in, and you just think, here we go again. Um, the, you know, it's 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 a weird one. This whole season's been racked up with it. There's, there was something like um, Liverpool have gone twenty one times out of 32 Premier League games behind the season. That's that's crazy in terms of stats. We talk about Liverpool, we talk about Van Dijk being, you know, an absolute stalwart. Alice has been injured for a period of time. Trent's obviously part of that defence. Robbo, we've had injuries, but to go behind 21 times, I'm sorry, it's going to catch up with you. And I think that's exactly what Sunday was. It was caught up with us. Um, it's about how we react to it now going forward. I did say... Um, I didn't believe the top three teams, as Liverpool, Arsenal, and City, could go the rest of the season without dropping points. I'm just hoping that's the only points we drop. Um, I would probably say, and I said this to John the other day, Fulham away on Sunday next week looks more tricky than it should be now. 
because of obviously Fulham's recent results and Liverpool's inability to keep a clean sheet. How much effort do we put into Thursday? Actually, on are we what kind of a team we have on Sunday? So we've got to turn it around. Um, but yeah, that was Sunday in a nutshell, unfortunately. It's, it's a title race. It, you know, it happens. I think all as supporters, we all look at fixtures and tick them off, um, thinking that we just roll teams over and it never works like that. There is always a game in there that, that throws up this. I think Liverpool are still well in it. Um, yeah. I, I don't think it's, a, it's been a bad week, but you're not you're not out of it. I don't, I don't think it's the full collapse as everybody's building it. As the reality of it is, it's all the people are only building that because of Man City's running. Yeah. But we never know. We don't know what tomorrow night's Champions League is going to throw up for them. It could be a bit of a Hail Mary. Um, if you would have said to me at the beginning of the season, with two points behind going into the last five games of the season, I would have chewed your arm off for it because of we finished uh, you know, so poor last season in the league. I would have chewed your arm off for it. So we're there. I just hope we do something now at the end of it. We kind of take it further. We get to the end. Um I'm glad to see people like Jota coming back now uh, because I do think he will. He can be a difference in games. He's probably the best finisher we have at the club. Um, yeah, I just we just we just need to get over this uh, this poor run of form that we're having at the moment in terms of being able to finish. Yeah, no, definitely. And Johnny on a, on a Palace side, um, as Jamie said there, I thought they started the game really really well. They could have been two, maybe three up before Liverpool really got going. Um, and you think the one that, that Robertson cleared off the line as well. Um, I thought I thought they were really effective um, early on, um, really decisive with passes, were brave, uh, and they, they, you know, he definitely got it right. Don't get me wrong; as the game went on, Liverpool missed countless chances, but you know, Palace rode it out, and, and it's a big three points for them because I don't think they were going to go down, but that. Then three points, especially at Anfield, um, just creeps them away from from everyone else. It's a massive three points, mate. Absolutely huge. Um, and for all Liverpool had all the chances that they did. Again, I mean, we're seeing this week in week out. Well, in recent weeks anyway, the I would say Palace looked the more likely. They looked the more dangerous throughout the game. Um, when they went forward, it looked more likely that they were going to grab a goal. Another one. Uh, and like you say, Mateta um, probably should have put more on it and he scores. Fair play to Robbo, he does really well to get back to that. Um, but the, yeah, um, they done really well. And I mean, it's probably a bit of a mulligan, a mulligan for them, sorry. Playing Liverpool, City, anybody like that away. So to go there and take maximum points is always going to be massive. I just felt like the Liverpool, the they're such a high pressed team. You don't get to settle when you play Liverpool. There's no time on the ball. There's no time to play out for the back. If you do that, you're going to get punished. That wasn't there at the weekend. Um, you've seen it for the goal, the first goal with Palace when they came. It was a brilliant goal, brilliant team goal. The build up was crisp, but Liverpool were nowhere near them. They were chasing shadows. And then when the ball comes into Eze in the box, he's unmarked. He, there's two defenders. I, I, I don't remember who it was, but they both see him, but nobody goes to him. He just has that free strike, free shot at goal. And that's not what we've really seen for Liverpool. Uh, so whether that's down to Jaded or the midweeks through them a bit, I don't, I don't know. I suppose only they know that. Um, it, is a, it is a dent. It's a huge dent to, to the running. I, I didn't think they could afford to drop points. When Jamie asked me last week, I think Colin asked a week or two before, I said that I thought Arsenal had the, the, the hardest running. Um, Liverpool potential, but I thought they would probably get through it. But I do not see City dropping points, and I'm still in that camp. I don't see them dropping anything. Uh, they, they've dropped that gear, uh, and we're seeing it. We're dismantling teams, and they are looking good. If they lose tomorrow and get put out of the Champions League, I mean, it could derail them a bit, absolutely, but I still I just don't see it happening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a massive three points for Palace. Uh, I thought they were they were worth their three points. Yes, they took a batter in at times, but that killer touch for Liverpool just isn't there. It's the same again with the Salah. He, he, Nunes, sorry, Nunes had a chance, and I don't know how he managed it, but he managed to actually take his shot and it went behind him. I didn't even think that was possible. So, yeah, an off day for Liverpool, definitely. Um, whether it has 
implications to the actual title. Time will tell. But I think it's going to be a hard task now. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah, agree with that. And, you know, we, we are normally, you know, with the, with the big sides <clears throat> turning our ball over. But, yeah, give, give Palace credit on, on that one. Jamie, you must have felt a little bit, a little bit better, just a little bit better. Um, a couple of hours later, where Arsenal, also at home, fell to defeat um, to Aston Villa now. Aston Villa are having a, an excellent season. Um, before the game, um, my, my mate actually said to me, he said, um, what do you reckon here? And I, and I said, a tough game for Arsenal. But v Villa were actually, before Sunday, Sunday, unbeaten in their last nine visits to London. And they've just made it 10 and they've done that with a win. Um, and and the, the way the game went, really, I just just thought it was Emery, you know, that, that, that he had them. I think Arsenal had, you know, a little bit, little bit of a few chances, but I just think Villa looked dangerous on the break. And to be fair, if anyone was going to score, it was going to be Villa. And um, what a what what a goal! Um, do, do you know what I think? The, what I think the, the best thing about that was is that they actually the, probably the first team to make Arsenal look mediocre in a game this season, because you know Arsenal have turned over some really big teams and big games and come out winners. Villa made them look really ordinary. Arsenal didn't have any ideas for what. Um, what Arsenal, what Aston Villa threw at them. Aston Villa arguably went in without some of the key players. Like Douglas Louise wasn't on the park, who's been arguably one of their best players and mainstays in the middle of the park. Um, you know, I thought Villa did an absolute number on them. They really did. Um, they, I think Concert, I'm not a big fan of Concert, but he's come out and done right back since they've had all the injuries. And he's actually been very, very consistent. He's done really well. Um, I think. Uh, Diego Carlos is looking, he's starting to look, you know, a bit of a slow water for them. And Pau Torres is just kind of, I think he's been brilliant this season. He, we did call him out as one to watch at the beginning of the season for buys. And I think he's probably, he's probably proven his worth. I think they've still got a problem at left back with whether, whether it's between Moreno or Lucas Dina, but the whole, from, from goalkeeper to striker, you know well how they're going to play and they don't falter from it. And Arsenal just didn't have an answer for it at the weekend. Um, it was made sweeter by all the, shall we say, all the tweets online after the Liverpool game was all the Arsenal podcasts getting ready for the game and they were all singing, you know, Palace songs, making, milking it up, thinking that they were going to go on to a two-horse race to then be humbled within two hours of, you know, I've seen people calling for Arteta's head, you know, saying he needs to be sacked after one result and it's absolute comedy gold. Um It'd be interesting to see. So the difference, uh, the, the difference is, is that Arsenal went on a bad run last season at this time where they weren't finishing games off. This is the first time we've seen them kind of banana skin of this season, if you like. They've got a really important game tomorrow night in the Champions League. It'd be interesting to see if they go out to that. What does that mean going into the rest of the games of the season? Because I think Johnny said the other day is that Arsenal's running is not one of the favourable ones. They've still got some tricky teams and they've still got the the, the Tottenham derby coming up. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the biggest thing I could say about Villa, as I said, is they actually did really well in making Arsenal look mediocre. Um, and I thought, Watkins took his goal superbly. He really did. Um, props to Watkins um, for that finish. But Tremendous result from from a Villa perspective. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I actually didn't realise it was Arsenal's first defeat since New Year's Eve against Fulham. Yeah. Um, which, to be fair, that's a that's a really good one. But you you absolutely spot in there, Jamie. I think this is where I always thought Arsenal would falter, and I've, I've yeah. been pretty consistent all season. When this stage of the season, I just don't. I still listen. They've done so well to sort of be here, but. I just think even Liverpool, I just think they've got that little bit, a little bit more that know how, know how to get over the line. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was there was an interesting thing I seen today on Twitter. And it was actually it was a it was like a top ten table of all the the, the highest goal scorers in the Premier League right now. And you've got you know you've got Watkins, Haaland, Palmer, um, who were, I think are sitting on twenty. Solanke I think is up there. Then you've got the drop into um, Salah and so called seventeen. Arsenal's highest goal scorer is on fourteen goals, and that's Saka. And you know, obviously, they'll go back to the fact that they don't have a traditional number nine. And I know Havertz has had the plaudits recently, but Sunday exposed what people do say in that they don't have that deadly 
give me the ball and I'll fucking run in behind and do something with it. They've always got the winkers that want to do the tricky things and they want to do the overplaying. Um, so it might come back to bait them, but um, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Johnny, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that's going to come back and, and buy Arsenal? Well, I think watching them on Sunday, I, I did think that at times. I thought there's no there's no really out ball either. There's no one to, to get Arsenal up the pitch. Um, it's very much they play their way, which they've done really well. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but there are times where you need to mix it up. And, and as Jamie says, you need someone to to just ch- to change it for you when things are not going well. And I do, I do think that that will that will be another reason why they don't win the league. I don't really have. I don't think Arsenal have really any massive standout impact players. Um, I think it's been that way for a few seasons. Last season, their bench was weaker. They have strengthened, they've strengthened well, but it's still the same kind of thing. Off the bench, they don't have a lot to change a game. What I didn't get at the weekend was, for me, if you're at this point of the season, right, where Arsenal are, so we're talking six league games left and whatever they do in the Champions League, it would have been seven before that loss at the weekend. Why are you changing your system, even if it's slightly, to accommodate other players? Why are you bringing, taking out that that unit that has been solid? They haven't looked like wobbling, to be fair. They have not looked like wobbling. They've been pretty professional, especially recently. They were blowing teams out of the water. They were, they were just they were looking good. And at the weekend, he forces in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus, for just because, pushes Havertz back a bit. Now, I know what Jamie's saying, but Havertz has been playing in that role. And recently he's been doing well. Probably best he's been at Arsenal. In fact, it is the best he's been at Arsenal. And he moves on back. So now you've got a change of the system. I just, I don't get it. It just, it's needless. You've only got seven, eight games left. Why fuck about it? Play your best team. Play your system that's working. And change it if you need to during the game. But don't do it prior and roll the dice. And that's what they've done. And yeah, it, it, it came back. Now, I was still surprised with the result, um, purely because Villa have been so erratic. You know, we spoke about that recently. They they turn up, they don't, and with Arsenal looking so well, they've been good recently. Um, well, they've been good all season. What am I saying? I wasn't expecting for that game to pan out the way it did, but again, they were they were just they were at least for maybe forty five fifty minutes. It wasn't a hell of a lot in it, but Villa had the better chances. You had. One cracked the post and then Telemans cracks the bar onto the post. Um, so th- there was warning signs there. There was warning signs that, you know, we could get caught here. But he never changed anything at that point. He waited till later. Martinez had a great game as well for Villa. I will say that. But they were just, they just got caught. They kept getting caught. The the one that I did here, Mark, the first goal, I don't know how much you paid attention like, to the, the replays and stuff. But when that ball falls to, to Bailey, He's at the back post. Now, he comes running back from within his own half. He's coming back and he's running alongside Martinelli. Martinelli looks, turns and sees him and then jogs into the box. Marks nobody, leaves Bailey five, ten yards behind him. He knows he's there, but he thinks, ah, it's not none. It's not, it's not a threat. That's exactly where they go. That's criminal. You're playing for a title. Absolutely criminal. So, yeah, I think it was a heavy, heavy loss for them. Um, like Liverpool, I just I don't think they can afford to lose the games. I don't think any team can afford to lose the games. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say the sign is that it is going to come back and bite them. Unless you see certain dropping points, then yeah, I absolutely will. Do you think as well, Johnny? You make a really good point there. Do you think that that with Arteta doing that and making the changes, that I think I think he's been put up there with the best managers in the league. Now, he's done really well with Arsenal. I'm, I'm not debating that. But I still believe that Emery is the third best manager in the Premier League. I, I was, I'll stand by that. And I think on Sunday, just in that game, as the later the game went on, Emery knew how to go and win the game for Villa, where Arteta was struggling a little bit. And I think that experience against Klopp and Pep, I still think Arteta's I, he's done really well. I just think when again at this stage, I just don't see him better than them two. Um, no, I, I don't think he's on the same par. Uh, 
I think the the striker thing, I know, I mean, it's something we've discussed a few times this season, but I think it's underplayed just how important it is because they don't have a prolific goal scorer. They haven't had one since the days of Henri and Bergkamp were running right. Um, it was probably, you know, they've always had maybe 10, 15 goals a season around the bit there. Now they're looking at midfield for goals rather than actual forwards. Um, you do need that. Even if it's off the bench, somebody to come on a game change again, and but that's down to the manager. The manager has to go and say, look, we absolutely need this if we want to take this title on a bit further, which it looks like he hasn't. Um, uh, I like Emery as well, mate. I think he's a very, very wise manager. I just at the weekend for me, there were so many red flags in that game, and for what I see for changes for Arsenal, it just what they needed to do to try and go and win the game, they didn't. Um, both goals were. Just poor, very poor. I think the second one was a slack pass that went straight on and Watkins went in and scored. So, yeah, I mean, I only really got themselves to blame at the weekend, mate. I think it was more so their own doing than Villa. And I'm taking nothing away from Villa when I say that. But for what Arsenal have and what Villa have been like, they should be winning that game. So, I just... Did they win a title under, under Arteta? Unless it's a huge invest, if they can even do that with FFP, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Johnny, you, you mentioned the changes. He's also one that got under the radar. He's actually brought Zinchenko back in for the Polish, like Kawori, who's actually probably done really, really well in the last few weeks. Um, he's grabbed a goal, he's got up front, but he's actually probably a better defender than Zinchenko. And uh, that that was, as you said, that first goal, you know, Martinelli's nowhere near um, because obviously Zinchenko's charging forward as well. Yeah. But those little tweaks is probably what's going to come back and, you know, give him. But here's a question. So I seen a thing earlier today, and it was talking about they were talking. It was somebody was having a Twitter beef about money spent, and I didn't actually realise it was so much. But under Arteta, they've actually spent six hundred and thirty-eight million. Yeah, and a lot is of it's a mental. Tough. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously you put one hundred and five or one hundred and fifteen or whatever it is for Declan Rice, but six hundred and thirty-eight million is a hell of a lot of money. On that basis, now this is going to be obviously, we none of us are Arsenal fans, so we're not biased in any way, but if Arteta finishes top three this season, and I'm not saying top two, I'm saying top three, and doesn't get any further than the Champions League or doesn't win it, is it a failure this season? I, I still don't think so, to be honest, Jamie, because uh, I think they'll be disappointed and they've got a right to be disappointed, but I do think with the age of their squad and the age of their players, I, I, I do think that it's, it's still they're still doing that. Do you know what I mean? They're still they're still building. Um, on a journey. They're on yeah, they are a little bit still. And and, and it's easy for me to say, as you said, because mm-hmm. I'm not a Arsenal fan, but I, I see this still as very much as a progression. That where they were, they were never gonna go <coughs> from 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 you know, I think they finished seventh, didn't they, before you mm-hmm. come in. And then they're suddenly just gonna go bang in a couple of years and win the league. It's not gonna work. And I do still still think they're they're building and it's going to take more time, but you know what football fans are like. You know, yeah. So impatient. The, the reason why I ask it is that with this big manager merry go round going around at the end of the, some, this, this year, I'd be very surprised if Barcelona don't don't come and talk to him just purely on the basis that he's Spanish and you know he's obviously got the obvious links with Barcelona. I think he was there as a youngster before you know he he, he moved to um, the you know Britain. There's just something about that that probably seems like a bit of a fit, you know. Uh, the amount of youth, I'd be surprised. Not, not. I don't. Not. I don't think you'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if he's there next season. I would just would be surprised if they didn't have approaches for him this season, you know. And as Johnny says, they probably need to spend a bit more money to push on, but they've only spent six hundred thirty-eight. You know, are they going to drop a hundred million on a striker? And if so, does that then become well? Now he needs to win more than I think he's won one FA Cup and and he's and at the time he's been at Arsenal. Just it's just trying to sum up obviously what, what looks like successful and done it really. Yeah. I mean, he's not. I mean, I mean, I'm looking at his signings. I mean, they're not awful, but I'm mm-hmm. looking at this again. Like we just say, there's no striker. Um, and I just I don't understand why they haven't done that. Uh, I mean, it was something that was earmarked last year as well. When they come very close, but they need the yes, they needed depth, but they needed a striker, and that's not been done. Mm-hmm. Um, what I will say about it is Arsenal fans are far from patient. You only need <laughs> those five minutes of Arsenal TV to work that out. Um, mm-hmm. And it, like Jamie says, they've lost 
at the weekend, which is the first day you used since Christmas. And they've hardly lost any of the season. And they've been much better than they were last year. I'll give that to them. Um, and they've went further. But, I mean, it's still progress. But I just, I don't think they'll be very patient. If they don't get it this year and they come close again, I think that noise will start to build quite quickly. It is typical Arsenal, though, and it? How many yeah. years did you say that on the winger as well? If only they went and got this one. If only they went and got that one. Um, they've got to be careful. It doesn't. It doesn't turn into that because, if they, yeah, because as you both said, the, you know, the, the, the fans will turn. They'll turn. I think he's a right man for them. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, you know what? I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. There's something right about it that actually yeah. I do I do agree that they're on this kind of a journey together and it stems from Arteta. I think their worst thing at the summer would be to lose Arteta. You know, that would probably set them back probably a couple of years. Um, so I do completely agree with that. It's just this whole this whole narrative, as you said, he's probably one of the best managers. I, I don't know about that yet. I, just, no. I don't know if no, they no, could justify that yet. I, I think I think you're, you're spot on. He's built, I think he's building... They're building, but he's not there yet. He might get there. And, and uh, you know, I, I do think these signs as well. I think if you look at some of the other managers and the signs they've made, you know, below them three, um, they've wasted one. I wouldn't say he's wasted. I think he's definitely building. But the fact they haven't addressed that striker issue, um, I think will cost them. Yeah, he's um, young too. I mean, it's a process for Arsenal. They're building to try and, you know, compete right to the death and take a title. He's learning as he goes. He's still a young manager as well. I mean, I mean, yes, he learned for Pep, but you don't really, you know, you don't fill the shoes properly until you're in the job yourself. He's not been there that long. No. Do you I, not think he's probably no. Pep's replacement? I think it's a good shot, to be honest, Jamie. I think it's a good shot. He, he obviously studied under Pep for a good few years as their number two, as their number one uh, the, the, the deputy. Sorry, and Pep would probably always give his back in, and you know he knows the league. It just it, there's just something about it that seems as probably that's a bit of a fit. But, then, but whether he would do that to Arsenal or not, though, yeah, that, that's the big one. As you said earlier, if he's going to go, money, is money, it, money, <laughs> is it to Barcelona instead of Man City? That's the big. The big question because yeah i agree with you on that as well i think the way he's going the way football managers are at the minute he will 100 percent get off of that barcelona drop suit 100 mm-hmm. um but yeah it's it's, uh, it's definitely a, an interesting one but jamie just to, to, to come back uh, to you we start you mentioned man city um Angela mentioned a little bit earlier on about they're just t- starting to turn the screw they beat uh and five one at the, at the weekend, which, to be honest, I think we, all three of us would have expected a comfortable Man City win. Um, they're now unbeaten in 41 games at home. And just now, this is the time where they do just start turning the screw, where the two, three, four, fives start rolling in. Um, they had Kovacic coming in on the weekend from the cold and scored an absolute screamer as well. Um, I just, uh, I think Johnny said it earlier, and I've got to agree with him, I just don't see where they're dropping points in this one. I think if you're a betting man, you're looking at the Tottenham game. They traditionally don't go to Tottenham and score many goals. Um, however, Ange Ball, which we'll, I'm sure we'll come on to, um, is very open. And if there was ever a team that were going to annihilate an open back line, <laughs> it's going to be Haaland and co. Um, so... I, I think that's where they're ultimately looking for. I think it's on the 14th. It's a Tuesday night under the lights. You can't help but think that Ange is going to have that team up for that game. Um, I, I fully anticipate Man City will win it. Um, do you know what I mean? Because um, they're Man City. But let's be honest, though, you didn't look at the last two weeks and think they could potentially slip up here. They were away to Palace and uh, they were at home to Luton. Um, the, the biggest surprise was probably the fact that they didn't keep clean sheets in both of the games. Um, they, they conceded two against Palace and they conceded, obviously, one at the weekend. And from what I've seen at the replays, they probably could have conceded more than one. You know, there was times when when Luton probably controlled the play a little bit. You can't really say much about that. I think the last time i seen a performance like that was, remember, Brentford went there last season and Ivan Tony told them a new one. They lost, they won the game. Um, but as Johnny says, <clears throat> the differences with Man City is... They can have an off day, but they've got five other players coming off the bench that are worthy of starting most other teams. I mean, who would have put Guardiola scoring two back-to-back goals, scoring his first two goals of the season, one against Real Madrid, and then another banger uh, at the weekend? Kovacic 
who the fuck is he? Where the fuck has he been for a year? But all of a sudden, he's back and he's scoring. So this is what Man City do. They, they find goals from all the players in the rest of the season. You go back to last season, and there was that period where Gundogan scored something like eight goals over the Christmas period. And then Jack Grealish was chipping in goals. They don't have that now, but they've got other players that... Doc, even Doc, who scored at the weekend, crying out loud. Do you know what I mean? So um, Johnny's right. Man City are just cheering the gears now. There's the... They might have a little blip, but I think the blip is that they can see goals, not that they will, might lose a game. That's the big difference that I think you've got now with them. That's a good point because, Johnny, that, that is the thing, though, with City. I think defensively they're not as strong as they were last season. And as Jamie said there, but watching them against Palace, you know, Palace could have had a couple more as well, or good chances. Luke and obviously Gabriel scored and, and could have. I, I, do, I do think that, don't get me wrong, going forward, they can go and score six six against her if you're not you're not at it. But I do think in the, I, I don't think they will. But I think that that Liverpool and Arsenal uh, is still to play for because the way they defended this season, it also wouldn't surprise me if City did drop points in, in, in them five games somewhere. Just the way that they, they, they've defended this season. I still don't see it, mate. No, I just don't see it. No, a. Uh... Yes, concede. Ah, yeah, ah, you're probably right. They will concede, but they 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 find a way, mate. They they can. Uh, they'll they'll happily sit there for eight to nine minutes and just probe a team and then punish when that when that one we gap appears. Um, also, we don't know where Spurs are going to be because that's the second last game of the season. Their season might be done by then. Depends how tight it is with the Champions League. That might be out of sight. You know, we we don't know. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, when Spurs turn up on the day, they, they, they can be really, really good. But we're also seeing at the weekend, they can be really, really bad. So I just, I don't see it. So I think City, best way to say it would be City are probably the most professional team in the league for the last few years at getting the job done. Um, and I, I just don't see that changing. Yes, they, I think they lost some of the potency absolutely before the season, but here we are, they're still there and they're doing the same thing again. That they've done pretty much every year, so I don't see that changing, mate. I thought the game at the weekend it was probably the most generic result <laughs> in the fixture card. You know, I think before that I can't remember. I think I predicted four one, so I was raging at that <laughs> when that fifth goal went in. But it just seen that one coming. Uh, Luton have done well, mate. I think the the last couple of months they've uh, definitely kicked on a bit and looked a lot more, much more solid unit. Uh, and now that, I mean, yes, they're in the position for getting thrown back down, but they still have a puncher's chance. You know, they're right on the tail of a couple of other teams, so they might get away with it. So I'm not really taking anything away from Luton. They're playing the best in the league at the worst possible time of the season, and they're playing at their end. So, yeah, I didn't really see any other outcome of that, mate. Uh, they came close a few times, absolutely, but... End of the day, it's still shipped five goals, mate. Shipped yeah. five goals. So, yeah, I didn't. It's one of the games, mate. There's six goals, but still not a hell of a lot to talk about. Uh, I mean, it's one game where Doku turned up. He's been absolutely terrible, but that seems to be the face for that lad. If you put him against a, 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 one of the lower teams in the league, he'll run right. You put him against a, like a solid wing back, he, he struggles. So, you've seen at the weekend the space they gave him. You just can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, but yeah, mate, it's uh, it's not the worst thing in the world for Luton. I think they probably expected that. Anything would have been a bonus for that game. They still have loads of good fixtures before the season's out and give themselves a chance. I think as well for Luton, it's eight uh, games away from home in the Premier League without a win. But if they're going to stay in the Premier League, it's not down to the away form. It's going to be the home form. Um, and that's going to be a big one for them. The thing is, the, the scoring goals. Every time we say it, but they're, they're running. If you're scoring goals, you're in with a chance. Even though they're getting beat, the scoring goals, they've got to just keep that momentum, and they'll get, they'll get. I think they'll pick up points. I, do, I think they might stay up. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Finish. I, I actually want to see it now. The closer. Yeah. Mm. It was like a, it was like a shootout. You know, like shooting fish in a barrel. Whenever mm. Kovacic hit, hey, Kovacic, sorry. Whenever Doku hit that line, there was like three or four City midfielders just waiting. At the edge yeah. of the box, same with corners, and they've only picked up. That's when Kovic is top bend that he just he had all the time of the world. Vadil did the same, didn't he? Top bend it from the yeah. edge of the box. But yeah. nobody knew them. They just they just kept going to the edge of the box because they knew it was working. And Luton never really 
never really got on top of it. That's the thing that Johnny said at the beginning, that, that the big thing that City probably do that most teams can't do is that constant grind. They just pepper you for so long that it ultimately just gives. You know, you can't be 100%. You're only human at the end of the day. You've got to be fatigued at some point. There's going to be that little slip. Rodri banging one in from 60 yards on an 89th minute is things we've come accustomed to because City always get there in the end. And I think they're just doing that now. Johnny, I'll come to you first then. We're talking about a team that are not defending too well, but can outscore anyone. Well, what's Spurs' excuse? Um, they were absolutely honking at the weekend, and that's been very, very kind. I thought <laughs> the last time they was at St James's Park, they got, a, I think they were 5-0 down after just, just over 20 minutes um, towards the end of last season. Well, it wasn't as bad <laughs> this season, but that first half, and again, the goals they can see, Johnny, I listen, I've given a lot of credit to, to Foster Cogby this season. I, he's someone that I think will do well for Spurs, but the constant high line is going to, especially with these games coming up, they could really fall down the table if they don't start them, you know, defending properly. Yeah, I don't think they have that in their DNA. Let's give a special shout out to, to Rio, Ferdinand and uh, Martin Keown for both absolutely bigging up Van der Ven before the game. <laughs> uh, he was uh, the next world-class defender, he was a world-beater, and let's not forget, we had to make an emphasis on the fact that in the last game he was clocked at 37.38 kilometres per hour, and that is the same average as Usain Bolt. Actually, it's slightly higher when he won all his medals at the uh, 2009 Olympics. That was what they were spouting, and then he's just he got put in his ass. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, I'm, the boy is he, the, the boy is a prospect. Absolutely, he just had a horrible day. So as well that they two done that and bogeyed them. Uh, they were honking me. There was two two one of those games where you had one team that were absolutely on it and played exactly how they have to against Spurs, and then you had Spurs at probably one of the worst. Um, I honestly thought before that Spurs would definitely score, uh, probably score a few just because Newcastle's defence is that injury ravaged. You know, it's a total patch up job. And they never looked bothered at all. They were marked able for 90% of that game. They, you had Werner, who's reverted back to happy feet, just kicking the ball anywhere. Um, Madison shouldn't have been on the park, he should have been off. Uh, it was just, just a mess, mate. Um, so I suppose. Spurs were dreadful, but yeah, credit to Newcastle, mate. I thought they were excellent. Really, really good. Uh, Isaac and Gordon absolutely tormented them for the for the entire game. So an off day for Spurs, but listen, we've called it a few times that for where they are, definitely it's a massive rebuild. They're, they're replacing Talisman, huge bit of their game, trying to find their feet. They've got a manager trying to find his feet in the league. It's going to take time. There is going to be games where they're dreadful, they lose, there'll be games where they're excellent. And I think, although I didn't expect it, I, I can't say I'm absolutely shocked by it. No, that's, that's really, really fair. Um, Jamie, just on the Newcastle front, I think we've, um, I think we've all, you know, give them fair criticism, criticism this season. <laughs> um, they've had a lot of injuries, which we've documented, you know, spoke about those times. But just looking at the table, that, that you know, I don't, I don't think it's a bad season for them if they can sneak in and get your open league football next season. Actually, I think that's a good season. I think it was unrealistic to think, in, looking at it, you know, from the outside, not obviously not being a new mm-hmm. club fan, that they were going to get Champions League football again. Liverpool was always going to come, you know, roaring back. Um, I think obviously the, 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 the thought process, the thought process was, is that the clubs that had stickers last season couldn't have a second stinker, and and you know you put Liverpool in that category, you put Tottenham into that category, but you know they were always going to come back, and therefore Newcastle would naturally fall back down. And to be a, to be an extent, they did, you know, they did. Injuries have obviously ravaged them. Um, you look at the starting lineup at the weekend, and you'd argue that six out of the eleven probably aren't first team starters. Would the Bragger you'd swap for Pope? You would have. Trippier instead of Murphy, you would have um, the the other boy at centre back opposed to Kraft, Longstaff, Anderson, Harvey Barnes has only just come into the team. You'd arguably say that you know half of their first team would be not available. 
I thoroughly expected Spurs to do them. I really did, just because the way attacking the way Spurs have been in attacking. But I think you know the match of the day actually documented it well. Newcastle got at them from the kickoff. They you know they were pressing the goalkeeper right to the you know all the way back from the actual kickoff. Um, I think uh, I think the Anthony Gordon goal goes in as they're still showing the replay of the Isak goal. You know they just absolutely tore into them. I mean, when can you often say that Anthony Gordon looked prime bloody Mbappe? Like, of all know, fucking people. Honestly, you know he's non-stop. He's looking good at the minute. He's looking... Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I want to pull, pull him apart, but I can't because actually he's playing at his skin. His attacking returns in the last few weeks have actually been very, very consistent. Um, and, and all of a sudden, Isak's the same. Isak probably not had the best of seasons, but the last four or five weeks, he's actually turned in really well. And I think it's just, you know, it's now gonna, now they've got to carry this on and, and kind of finish as best as you said, trying get it back on target to to finish as high as they can. They potentially could sneak in there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I was very surprised at Postacoglu's persistence in playing the way they were. And what I mean by that is, like, it was quite evident that, as Johnny said, Johnson and Werner on the wings wasn't working. So instead of bringing Kulisevsky and, um, you know, was freshened up, he took Son off. <laughs> arguably the best finish he had no service throughout the game can't exactly be labelled the fault for any of the goals that happened but kind of made a bit of a statement by taking him off I think he took him off at around about the 58 minute mark can't really say that much about Son in his game that he's he, he comes off at those kind of times if anything he's the one that you want to make sure is coming on but he persisted with the Werner that wasn't working and Johnson um, Richardson's obviously not the uh, preferred number nine. They've got a big summer ahead in terms of a striking opportunity because for me, they need to get some back on that left wing. That's where he's more effective. But then midfield, I I don't put, I don't think Basuma is half as good as what they expected him to be. I think the lad saw who's arguably been better, but is probably still average. I do like Benton Coe, but he didn't look as though he was having a good game at the weekend as well. He's had a long time out injury. And there was that whole complete disconnect between the, you know, from middle to the front, from the defence, the middle and the, the attack. And if anything, I feel sorry for the goalkeeper, Fusario, because he's actually been one of the best signings this season. Um, and even, you know, he couldn't do much about it. So I think props to Newcastle. I thought they were brilliant at the weekend. I think they do miss with Charleston. For all he gets pelters, he gives that outlet. Yeah, he's a he gives him the shit way up top. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> he but buys the free kicks, doesn't he? Yeah. He was finding the goals before that injury. Um mm-hmm. and that outlet is there with, with Sun. I think you're limited with that. I agree with you, he's better on the left. Him on the left and the Charles and through the middle, I think they're a better team. And do you remember at the beginning of the season as well, like four games into the season, everybody's saying Madison is by far pound for pound the best signing of the window. Like he, he's Madison's overrated he's not, shite. I'll say it. Yeah. He's he, proper. Like, I think he's really good on the ball, but see when you're up against it, he's not the kind of player that you want in your team. And I go back to his Leicester days when Leicester were fighting, Madison wasn't nowhere to be seen to, to some extent. He, you could say the same about half of the team, but like that's he was remember he was shit out, he should have been mid corner against Nottingham Forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolute stinker on Saturday. Yeah, he had an absolute stinker on Saturday. Like this is meant to be the talisman. This is meant to be the you know everything goes through him. I mean, my my biggest great with, with Madison is when he's on his game. I'll give him that he's excellent. Yeah, he's excellent. But he's not on his game anywhere near enough. And when they are under the cosh, he goes missing or he spits a dummy and goes into shit yeah. house mode. But just seen through the last two weeks. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think with Madison, I think that's the highest he can go. I think Tottenham's a good club for him. <clears throat> yeah. He ain't getting in the, he ain't breaking into the, the cities, the Liverpools, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Arsenal's of the world right now. Um, I, I, I agree with you both on there. But, but you remember there was that question though when he signed for Tottenham, everybody was saying, why we're sitting on him for him? Why we're not Liverpool and stuff? And I think this is the reasons why, is yeah. that managers do like him, but they also see another element to him um, that, not it's not destructive, but it just doesn't work. And you can see that in the last couple of games. Like when he's up against it and he's getting the shit kicked out of him and he's getting roughed up, he reacts. You need people to be level headed and not get involved, but Madison seems to get involved, doesn't he? You just get his head. Just get his head. Like um 
more pay time, wouldn't you? You just get his head. <laughs> and do you know what? You could probably take it back to that game. Since that game, you know, you can't say he's had too many good games since that Brentford game. You know, when Neil Bopey got on his face and there was that old tink ding gong. Um, he's probably been, been off his game a little bit since then, I would say. Johnny, um, I'll, I'll come to you on this one because we've, uh, we've come to you lots this season when Chelsea have had poor results. Um, but <coughs> <laughs> last night was was uh, was obviously the result of the season in terms of goal scoring and and Cole Palmer um, it, it just running out of sort of credit really for him. He was he was excellent last night. Um, he's three goals in the first half. He, well, the two two of them are really good goals. He follows up obviously with the header of the third, gets the penalty. Um, all round a, a really good night for Chelsea and. Um, yeah, as I said, there's plenty of criticism this season. Um, still got two, I think still got still got two games in hand on on on, above, um, on West Ham, who are, are a place above them. So they can could you know climb into them Europa League spots, but they need to keep that consistency, and that's been the problem when they've had a result, a good result, they haven't uh, backed it up. I I just feel mate. Um, next two are difficult as well. We've got Arsenal away and Villa away. Uh, but you just don't know what you're going to get for Chelsea, mate. The like you seen last night when they when they're on it, they have the ability to give any team in the league trouble. But it's just never been anywhere near enough this season. I think one thing I will pull for it is that Chelsea have had pelters all season, and a lot of the time, rightly so. And we talk about Man United, and we keep saying, "Oh, you know, the the they're, they're, they're that far off it." But at least they're still, you know, sixth, seventh in the league. Chelsea are right on top of them. And one's supposed to be having the worst season ever, and the other one's having a mediocre season. How does that work? You know what I mean? There's there's nothing in that. Um, I agree with you, though, mate. It could face plant because with how erratic they've been. The game itself, mate, they were just on it, absolutely on it. They gave Everton no time, uh, no chance to, to get their sale into the game. They defended well. Uh, obviously, Everything comes down to Cole Palmer in an attacking sense. Um, I'll keep saying it till I'm blue in the face, but I still think he's a sign of the season. Uh, the impact on that team is unbelievable. And he's doing it in a team that are struggling a bit. The perfect hat trick as well, not to forget, and another one on the top just to, just to polish it. Uh, they have been poor this season, but. I mean, but barring the early on, Everton had a chance to shoot a score of Beto was in the first couple of minutes. That was really the main threat of that game. He managed to put it over. And only, knew, only he knows how he done that. And they are notoriously difficult to play against. They make games ugly. They, they flood the midfield. But it did not look like that at all. Chelsea found space everywhere. So I think it was a night where Chelsea were absolutely on it. Everton absolutely weren't. Um, 40 million, I think we paid for Palmer. So he took that money and bought Doku. Uh, we'd take that deal every day of the week. Every day of the week. So, yeah, mate, I was delighted with the result. It was nice to have it. I'm not going to talk about the penalty. I'm going to let Jamie do it because I'm just going to get wry. Um, <laughs> I just, I said, no, I get it's just so bloody stupid and schoolboy embarrassing stuff. Yeah. But I do not want to take away the shine for. The result no. and for Palmer, Palmer's display because we're talking about that penalty more than we're talking about Palmer. He's a mm-hmm. homegrown talent, you know. What I mean, they should be nurturing that, get them to the Euros, get them progressing. That penalty is just a shambles. All a uh, Poch has to do is had this problem in Madueke before the attitude, drop him for a few games, drop Jackson, he's shite anyway. That's how I would deal with it. That would be it fixed, you know what I mean? A wee bit of authority and just say, look, that's not acceptable. End off. So yeah, mate, the way we result. There's another stat as well, but I'll let Jim, I'll let Jamie tell you that as well. Well, just before I go on to that, on Cole Palmer, he was the first um, Chelsea player to score a first half hat trick. Um, I'm surprised that one. I thought Frank Lampard surely have done that, um, but Cole Palmer was the first one. Um, yeah, absolutely I agree there, Johnny. I think he's, he's a must for the Euros. He's absolutely flying at 40 million. Not often does that. It's a steal. It's a steal for the, the talent that he's got. Jamie, I'll 
he oh. sorry, he broke he broke Drogba's record last night as well. The record was uh, six games on the bounce to score at home at the bridge, and he that was seven last night for Palmer. Yeah, he's, 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 he's quality. I, I can't understand why why City let him go either. Um, but Johnny, uh, Jamie, I'm going to come to you on the on the penalty incident because I uh, absolutely agree there with, with Johnny. It has taken it away the result and the performance. I, I hate to see stuff like this, and yeah. I think when we talk about Chelsea having that inconsistency. And that, you know, why I keep asking the question, why are they not backing up results? Why are they performing like this? When I see stuff like that, I go, that is why. Because there's an, to me, that's an attitude problem, especially the two yeah. players kicking off like that. It's, it's shocking. So I feel like I need to clarify something before I'm going to hit anyone with tail top, top between my legs because it was roughly 10 days ago that I said about Cole Palmer and he's had two back-to-back hat tricks and scored a goal. He's scored something like seven goals in the last 10 days since I said this and I've been absolutely slaughtered for it. And I just want to clarify, no way, I didn't, I, what I meant by Cole Palmer is I don't think he's shit, I think he's a brilliant prospect. What I said is that in a true full-on Chelsea team as it stands, would he be as effective as he as he being asked a lot of of him? Like they're obviously going to build the team around him now, but they didn't buy him thinking they were going to build a team around him. Um, but I think the lad's been absolutely class the last few weeks. What I will say about the penalty is that I've actually got a lot more desire for the lad because he still stood up to all of them, took the ball off them, and went, "No, no, yeah. I'm taking this. This is my role. Get the fuck out of the box." Basically, I'm more. What the fuck is Jackson doing? What the fuck is Madawiki doing? And it's not the only time it's happened this season. It's happened a couple of times. I think the Madawiki tried to take it off him in the cup, and it was at an FA Cup game, I think it was. And then I think Jackson tried to do it in a league game. Like, I get players. I've seen, I've heard both sides of the story. I've heard some Chelsea fans say, "Well, we were four 0 up at the time. Why is he not sharing the goals?" It, but it was only a couple of weeks ago that Chelsea were three 0 up. And uh, I think uh, who was it who came back and scored three goals against them? I forget. Yeah, two, two, two up. Was it two nil? Was it two nil up, and they came back. And yeah, you, you're yeah, like, no, time. put them to the fucking sword. If that, if if, if you're gonna go five, six goals up, then fucking do it. And, yeah. You know, um, if you're gonna share the goals, I understand that. But Chelsea are into the position where they have that luxury of saying, "Look, guys, we're playing as a team," because actually, what that did show to everybody last night, and Johnny doesn't like this, is exactly what you said, Mason. It shows actually the disparity that, not that they're not in it together, but it shows that there's still something not right within that team. You know, Madueke, for example, is not the first name on the team sheet. Neither is Nicholas Jackson. You know, if you look at some of the signings that they've got, these are bit part players, these are squad players, and they've got the balls to try and take off a 21-year-old lad who's obviously the designated penalty taker. That tells you that there's something wrong with the ethos of the team. I would lay the blame at 100% Pochettino's door. I know he's obviously come out and said that I don't like it, yada, yada. But for them to have the balls to do that means that they don't fully understand that the manager has crystallised He's our number one penalty taker. If he's not on the park, you're taking it, yada, yada, yada. You could go through pretty much every team in the Premier League right now and you'll know who their penalty taker is. The only people I think have rotated it this season are Arsenal. Sack has taken some, I know the God's taken some, I think even Race has taken some, but that's them. They're winning games, so they have the luxury to do that. Everybody knows in Chelsea, Palm has taken the penalties. The last person that didn't take a Chelsea penalty was it was it Raheem Sterling? And I think that ball's still in the sky now. And he yeah. got absolutely slaughtered for it. So there must be some disconnect there that whether either Pochettino's not been clear or the team think that they're above the manager's rule. And you you do not want it to be the second one. So if it's not the second one, then you've got to go back to Posh and say, right, crystallize this. Put his name up on the fucking board if that's what you need to do and say he's the penalty taker. Because see the moment they don't do it. They're gone. They're That's gone because why, they're, they're, they're dismaying, obviously, the rules, aren't they? Is, is all, sorry. This is why Madureki was dropped for a long period yeah. of time because he was attitude. And Poch mm-hmm. publicly called us. This was months ago. Um, he'd done it before, but also his attitude's honking. Apparently, mm-hmm. he was lazy in training, that kind of thing. And that's why he was dropped. And 
he came out and said he had improved, blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, take away that, and you've got a decent player. I mean, at the weekend before, he was the Ch Chelsea's best threat, my mm -hmm. Um And he's a good impact player too. But I think the problem, talking to attitude, I, I, I think that you've got two. You've got two issues in there. You can't really go with Sterling. Sterling's the greediest player in the world. You know that. <laughs> like, he would steal the steam from your piss if you weren't watching. But Sterling's got like five four league titles to back it up, though, hasn't he? He's got he's got the two yeah, that's to look fine back on if you're bagging <laughs> goals in, but his form's mm -hmm. been absolutely honking. He's just wanting to take that because he's desperate for a goal. But then, like you say, that's where the authority comes in. I also put some of the blame, not the blame, but Gallagher's the captain. He's in the middle of that, and he takes far too long to sort that. He should just be yeah. saying right away, "Give me the ball," and he takes the penalties, and that's it. <laughs> I think that the, the attitude in there is Madueke and Jackson are just, especially Jackson. Jackson's just, he, that lad is not wired properly. We've seen him this season, some of the times he loses a head and that. He's an absolute headbang. Uh, so he's no loss to that team, And from my point of view. I mean, if Jackson left tomorrow, I would not, I, I'd drive him, I'd pick him up. Madueke, I'd like to see him improve and keep him on. But yeah, that, it's just not, it's not acceptable. And he has to deal with it. Do you, do you not do you not think though? Uh, absolutely agree with it. Do you, do you not do you not think though that that doesn't happen? Two things: if one, the manager's not as as Jamie says, the manager's not stronger in terms of. Um, so imagine a player doing that to Sir Alex Ferguson; it just wouldn't happen. And two, if John Terry was captain last night, he solves that quick. And I don't even think they get to that situation where there's a proper leader. I still think with Chelsea, we've got a lot of young, good players. When I see things like that, I just think, who's running the dressing room in there? Who, where's the leaders? That that would be my question because I, I think it happened once. It shouldn't happen again, and it's happened again, and it's and it's, pu it's public. These things are not behind closed doors of training; they're public. I think they don't have it. Yeah, they don't have that in that squad. They don't have that leadership player. Um, yeah. Like for me, if it's my team, I would rather have an English player in there that's running that team. Right, and I don't, I don't say that in any way bad. If I, if I have that option, that's where I'm going. So I can understand why it's went to Gallagher, but it has to be vocal, vocal, and it has to be strong. Right, maybe that's the best option they have. I'm assuming Silva's probably been offered that. I know he's had it in the past. That would be your logical choice, but maybe he's just not comfortable with it. I don't know. But the, Johnny, the, the, am I not right in thinking? No, there, the, is he not third choice? I think it's Rhys James and it's Chilwell. Who are the captain and the, the vice captain? Yeah, and they were. Or something, aren't they? they were. I don't know if that's still the case. At the start of the season, they were. But having them as your captain is like farting into a hurricane because they never play. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a pointless exercise. So I can understand why it's Gallica. Yes, he has to be stronger. I don't know the deal with Poch. The right? bottom line is, none of us know how he dealt with Madureke the first time and how he dealt with Jackson when he had to have all those words with him about all the needless yellow cards. We don't know. He could be absolutely giving them the hairdryer and they are just problem players. Or it could be him not being strong enough and having to get a bit more authority. I don't know which it is. No idea. But it has to rectify it because it's too, like I say, it took some of the polish off what was a great result. And more people were pushing the narrative about that penalty than they were about the actual result. That's the way the video worked. So, yeah, he has to rectify that. Yeah, Jamie, just, just really quickly then, just to finish on that one, we'll just quickly touch on Everton. Um, they were dreadful. They did, you know... They were, more than dreadful. they were more than dreadful. I think me and Johnny spoke before the game and we, we talked to actually this could have been about a major banana skin for Chelsea. Monday night football, Everton are scrapping for points. Chelsea don't really react well to constant pressure, which Everton normally do. But they just did, it just didn't happen at all. They looked... Do you know what? They look like a championship team playing a Premier League team. That's probably the worst kind of thing I can say about Everton. Uh, Johnny was right. I think Beto missed an absolute sitter right before the first goal went in. But the moment the moment Palmer decided to start, you know, he, what he showed was actually just grew, he took the game by the by the scruff of the neck and just kind of dragged it through, didn't he? He scored that goal, uh, linked up really well with Jackson, and then all of a sudden it became he became there was so many loose balls in the box and they were just reacting well to them, but. Uh, Everton looked really, really poor last night. That was actually Sean Dyche's worst win, uh, sorry, worst loss as a manager. He's never lost 6-0 before. Um, and it probably just, you know, 
it probably just quantifies where where Everton are at the moment. Um, they're scrapping for points. Um, I can guarantee you one thing: I bet they don't play that bad against Liverpool in a week's time. I guarantee you they don't play that bad against Liverpool in a week's time. Um, but they are they're dangerously close to the you know the the, the bottom three. I think the two points off. They've got this. Uh, they've got this two point um, deduction uh, slapped on them, which they've now appealed. Um, I would be surprised if they got those two points taken away. But again, I was surprised that they they got so many points taken away in the first one. So they're scrapping for everything at the moment. But you look at their next set of games, um, and I think um, Everton are at home against Forest. They're away. Yeah, they're at home against Brentford. And sorry, let me go back. So they are the next two games. I think they've got four home games in a row. They've got Forest at home, Liverpool at home, and then Brentford at home, um, and then they're away to Luton. So I think they could either be in the mix. Or they could have got themselves saved by then, um, but I think th- this is going to be a crucial point, crucial time for Everton. Look at Luton drumming. I'm putting my money on Luton. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, I go with that as well. And the big thing is, is you look at the score goals. Like they're struggling to score. They, I think they scored. Uh, as I said, it was uh, last week when they won one 0 against Burnley was very lucky goal where the goalkeeper blasted it off Calvert Lewin and it went in the goal. Um, they're the, the struggling to score. Simple as. I think this first game they play against Forest at home. If they don't win that, then I would say that's when I would lean towards Luton. Because they do have a game yeah. in hand, but they really need to win that game. Absolutely. Johnny, stay with you. Just to, we're only going to have time for one more game to talk about this week, I think. Um, and I'm going to go with the Bournemouth 2, Man United 2. Um, again, just watching Man United and um, you make a really good point earlier actually about Chelsea season being touted as a disaster and it's been all full rubbish. I watch Man United again and I'm just like, they're so, I just defensively so, so poor. Okay, they had a, a point against Liverpool last week where, you know, don't want to go back over that again, but I think Liverpool should have had the game wrapped up before before uh, United even score. Um, but Bournemouth, Bournemouth should. I think Bournemouth were good. Bournemouth were decent. Just, uh, I, yeah, I think I'm really unlucky not to win the game. I just, I just, this Man United team for me, I just, I just don't see it. I don't see where they're going with Ten Hag. Uh, yeah, me. Listen, they are papering over cracks every week. And a friend of mine described it almost perfectly at the weekend. We were talking about the game. We were watching it, and he said, "I, I kind of, I." I'd, alluded to the fact that Man United have been absolute dog meat um, so many times this season but keep scraping a point here or sometimes winning the game late on in games and when they just don't deserve a thing. Um, it was the same thing at the weekend and he said that the Premier League uh, the Premier League's best at getting scabby goals uh, and I mean as, as rough as that is he's, he's absolutely spot on. It was, at the weekend they were how Bournemouth never won that game, I have no idea. I suppose you have to say it's their own fault because they had so many chances, crazy amount of chances. Um, you have the... Uh, then it comes down to a scabby penalty. And, and it was a horrible penalty. You know, one of those handballs that you don't want to see given and that's how they get back in the game. They, they were just... They were not great at all, mate. And it's, it's happening every other week. So... Man United fans probably hate me, but to be fair, I've slated Chelsea plenty of the season as well, and that's the team I follow. I don't think Man United are any better. Um, they're, they're not good to watch. They, they've been getting battered week in and week out, and the only reason they're getting away with it is because the other team's poor finishing. That's happened the last few weeks, and that, that was exactly what happened at the weekend. Bournemouth should have absolutely had them. That game dead and buried by, what, 50 minutes? 60 a push, but yeah. Uh, I felt bad for them, mate, because they absolutely deserved it. It would have been a big three points for Bournemouth and they were well worth it. But yeah. no, I mean, I thought they were a bit unlucky late on, you know, when they got denied that penalty. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was just one of the... It was, all I would say about it is I understand that the foul will start is just outside the box, but if it carries in, it's supposed to count. I thought it carried in, but I, what I would say is it wasn't clear and obvious that it didn't 
yeah. either way. So the VAR shouldn't have been touching that. It should have just been left as it is, you know. And they never they got stuck their nose in it. So again, dodged another bullet. I don't know how long they can go on like that, mate. Uh, I think they have a weak squad. They have some talent there, absolutely, but they have so much dead wood that that problem's been there for years. See, every year they need a clear out. It never really happens. So, does he stay on close season? Mate? I would be surprised if he was there next season. I would be. Yeah, yeah, same, same as me. Jamie, anything to, to add on, on that? I've, I've been calling it all season. Ten Hag's not there next season. There's no way he survives this. The only really reason he's still there is because they've got an FA Cup semi final. And, you know, they'll, 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 they'll do. Actually, I expect them to get past Coventry and they'll go into a final, and that'll be his last game, um, in my opinion. The, that what Johnny said, the reason why Bournemouth didn't win that game was because VAR got into, involved when it shouldn't have. That is 100% on the line. The ref gives the penalty. VAR cannot be conclusive, and it doesn't. It shows it can't be conclusive because it doesn't draw any lines or anything like that. So again, it's opinionated. So you have to leave it as the decision, which is which is that it was in the box. So I'm very surprised that VA got involved in that. Um, it was re- it was really good watching. Actually, I was watching my match, match of the day. I watched the game um, live because I had um, both team, both teams to score and over two point five goals was the most obvious results from a betting perspective in that game, and I had it on the go. But watching the game on match of the day, they dissected it well. They showed you actually some of the the poor decision making from wing backs moving into midfield, trying to do things like what Sinchenko does, what Trent does, um, you know, where the, where, the, where the winger moves into the midfield, creates a bit, of, a, bit of, a bit of more resilience in the midfield and obviously sprays the ball out. Diego Dalot doesn't do that. He's not that kind of a player. He's been asked to do things and all of a sudden, I think within the first minute, Ananas kicked the ball out because he's got nobody to pass it to. Garnaccio gets hooked, rightly so. He makes some really poor challenges, doesn't track back, but now there's this whole thing about liking social media posts of people calling out Ten Hag, and now he's been fined. So there's now you're going to start to see more holes with the squad falling out with the manager. There's already talk about people being disbelief of actually his his persistence at continuing down the strategy that's obviously not working for them. So I 100% do not think Ten Hag is there next season. Um I think they, Man United just need the end of the season to get clo- the close season to happen now. Um, Rashford is nowhere near it. Monty Marshall's already confirmed that he's not going to be there next season. The, the lad Hoyland, I feel sorry for, he's constantly running up front and he gets no passes. He gets no he's touches. He's isn't he? He's so isolated, you know, and, and that's that's the weak point. Because Rashford, you know Rashford's going to continue with the ball. So all you need to do is double up on him. You know he's not going to cross it. You know he's not going to hit the barrier. He's going to try and take it into the box. You double up on him when he's gone. Ganaccio's obviously the speedier one, so you give him the five yards and run off him. It, it, it's so obvious how to play against Manu at the moment. Um, Kobe Mainu, arguably one of the best or better players again at the weekend, but I think there's, there's massive problems within Man United, and I think it's there for everybody to see. Um their biggest problem is who, how many can they ship out and replace, and that's the manager included. Yeah, yes. Well, one, one wee thing, mate, a wee shout out for Dominic Solanke. That boy's having the season of his life. I believe that's him oh, now the Premier League, that's Bournemouth Premier League all time top goal scorer uh, yep. since the Premier League years. And we give Watkins so many plaudits, you know, he's getting plaudits everywhere. He's only got two more goals in the league than Solanke. Yeah, you know, overall he's got more, but Premier League goals he's on 19, Solanke's on 17. Uh, considering where he is, and you know, he's doing it down on the, the lower end of the table, it's a, it's a really good tally for the lad. Here's one for you, just, just to fully wrap this Man United, if they were to go on and win the FA Cup, let's just say the stars are lined and they won the FA <laughs> Cup, do you think that would keep no, Ten Hag's job? He's still gone. No, he's he's still gone. gone. I think, I think he leaves on a high. Yeah, I think I think that the the ownership's got to see through that. And listen, he, he did, do you know what though? He he would deserve credit. He did win the FA Cup. Depending where they finished in the league as well, I suppose. Um, he won the League Cup last season. But yeah, I think if if I was a Man United fan, you've got to see past that because there's no for me there's no progression. There's no style of play. There's not players there that are, I would say really improving. Um, 
I, I think, I think if, there's, if there was a, a style of play there, there's players improving and he got your transfers right in the summer, I'd say 100%. But none of that's for me to come in together. So even if they did somehow win the FA Cup, I think they'd still need to get rid of it. That's one for your listeners, mate, or our listeners. But yeah. I know there'll probably be a few that do follow Man United. So if they do win the FA Cup, does Ten Hag keep his job? Or do you want shot at him anyway? And if he doesn't, does he definitely go? I think the biggest the biggest question is who do they replace him with? Because if you believe the murmurs behind Ineos, is they they're really really keen on the Southgate setup and the Deserby setup, and no Man United fan is going to accept that. And if that's the pool that they're looking at, I think it's going to be a long hard slog for Manchester United. But then you've got to back it up and say, well, who could come in? There's not. Could eight people that you think would take that job at this moment in time? That's if they would take that job. I don't know if they would. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Get on the phone to Graham Potter. Bring your wand. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, but that's what I mean. I wouldn't be surprised if they went with somebody like that. But I don't think Man United fans will, want, will be accepting of a person like that. No. But their true. expectations against how Man United are going to proceed are going to not align and they're going to this whole Ineos thing is the marriage of Ineos is I think that's going to have a few more hairline cracks shall we say definitely good, good really good point there Johnny uh, listeners definitely get your thoughts on that um, and just to wrap it boys we're not going to have time obviously we're running over the hour but West Ham were beaten at home by Fulham 2-0 um, Leggy West Ham and struggling a little bit uh, expecting to go out of Europe this week Brentford beat Sheffield United 2-0. Sheffield United have conceded 84 goals and have failed to keep the clean sheet in 17 away games. From uh, yeah, away games, Forest drew 2-2 with Wolves. Um, again, I think at a point, not really Forest taking the lead twice, would have been disappointed there. And then to, to wrap it up, Burnley won, Brighton won, and it's two absolute goalkeeping nightmares there um, where... Um, Murick, I think, is for, for Bernie. That is a proper howler. That's one you used to see on the, the DVDs. Um, That's been two and two weeks now. <laughs> two hours and two weeks. So. God, God, get, get him out of the team there. He's costing Bernie <laughs> uh, But last thing to do is, is thank my guest tonight. Start with Jamie. Thank you for coming on, mate. Uh, thank you very much, as ever. Um, I love talking all shit about the Premier League and what my thoughts are, and they don't amount to nothing. But uh, fingers crossed, we have uh, some bounce back ability to talk about next week. <laughs> I think you will, mate. I think you will. And Johnny, thanks as always for tonight, mate. And thank you, both of you lads. Enjoyed it very much. Uh, for the listeners, I am now the president of the Cole Palmer Fan Club. You can <laughs> apply with your membership. Just there's there's the only one per- membership of one. <laughs> <laughs> no, Frank's in as well, my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, who's Cole Palmer? I'm joining you, mate, as well. I'm joining you. Um, <laughs> no, thanks, boys. And uh, thanks, listeners. We'll be back next week to maybe talk about some of the teams we haven't been able to talk about tonight in more detail. But as always, take care. 